When it comes to offering items that give you passive perks, most games either make them glorified collectibles that just serve as an extension of the already existing skill tree, or they're special items locked until New Game Plus to begin with. So for Dead Rising to give you such powerful items from the get-go is a truly unique system in an already pretty unique game. It can give an edge to newer players, it helps add some depth to a series of otherwise really simple systems, and it offers a good deal of experimentation for new playthroughs, regardless of the player's level. Which is why it's a shame they're rarely talked about beyond triple booking the small chainsaw. How many players even know that you can triple book the scythe as well? How many people have turned the weapons card into a longer lasting version of the white sedan? Does anyone else know that the mannequin torso can be made to last 450 hits? So with how most people don't even talk about the books, the fact there's no tier list on them is hardly surprising. It's also unacceptable. I spent hours messing around with each book to get a feel for their perks and the effects on the gameplay. I also did some calculations when necessary. This isn't me trying to act like my opinion is objective just because I made some objective observations. I just want this list to account for more than my playstyle. There's a lot of different reasons to play Dead Rising, after all. I have the full list of requirements on screen right now, but a general rule to keep in mind is that the more a book can do on its own, the higher it's gonna rank. Thankfully, since books don't have any downsides, this means there's no F-tiers. But man, it's hardly a 24-way tie for first place. So sit back, get a drink, put on your happy face, and get ready for some light reading. So I'll admit, it can be pretty fun to just grab a bunch of the toy cubes and go to town on herds of zombies. But that's as useful as this book gets, and even that's not a practical strategy. The toy cubes stop locking on as early as four zombies, compared to the soccer ball's eight targets. And they do less damage by default, so Frank really needs his range damage to be maxed out to reliably kill even common zombies. The toy cubes also only spawn in Wonderland Plaza, so this isn't exactly an ideal improvised weapon most of the time. And that's the highlight of this book. The boomerang's fun and all, but in terms of using it practically, if you have enough room to wait for this thing to come back to you without a zombie sneaking up on you and giving you a love bite, you probably have enough room to just walk around the zombies in the first place. Then there's the frisbee, which can kill zombies with a headshot at level 50, but that's because you're throwing a weapon at level 50. With maxed out range damage, anything you throw instantly kills with a headshot, which includes plates and CDs, which, first of all, give you 30 shots compared to the 15 this book gives the frisbee, and you don't have to retrieve them. Also, unlike the frisbee, they deal actual damage. Yeah, the frisbee, if it doesn't hit them square in the forehead, just knocks them over, which means you have to retrieve it next to a very angry zombie that you just hit in the face with plastic. Then there's the rat stick, which takes forever to kill zombies, especially at night, and throwing it means you have to wait for the bleed-out effect, which, combined with the low damage it does when thrown, means you're going to be waiting a decent amount of time. Also, the durability barely puts this thing over the standard lead pipe, which is literally just a better version of the rat stick and way more common. There's the toy laser sword, which in theory is useful, except no. Let's take a moment to ignore how the 2016 ports made them all brighter at night so you could naturally see, a choice I honestly prefer, actually. In the best case circumstance, this is something that you can only use to light up the way. Its actual combat usage is awful. The zombies can almost get up faster than you can whack them with it. You're just gonna get surrounded trying to use this thing. And it already lasts for 80 hits by default. Yeah, this thing is built to last. That is to say nothing of the fact that this thing won't even light up if you're not in the night version of that part of the mall, but that's a rant for another day. Finally, there's the novelty helmets. So for these things, take that lackluster durability for the frisbee or the rat stick and combine it with the impracticality and outright misuse of the item with the toy laser sword. Not of any practical use outside of showing off that you're at level 50. Hmm, only good for showing off when you're at level 50. That's this book in a nutshell, and it's the reason it's the sole E tier of the list. Hmm. 
And now for the complete opposite direction. Camera 2 offers the player the incredibly useful ability to double all PP from photos. Given that the camera can earn 500 to 1000 prestige points for a single good shot, that's actually a really nice effect. What results in Camera 2 being this low on the list, damn near the bottom, is that it's locked behind Ken's mission, meaning nearly every photo opportunity is long since passed. Nearly all the bosses are dead. There's literally one survivor who spawns after this mission. If you're going for the true ending, you'll be too busy with the game itself to take pictures of just about anything. And if you're not, there's really nothing left to take pictures of except if you already saved Cheryl or want to get some of the prestige point stickers you haven't found yet. You're probably also going to be level 30 by now if you plan to take on Kent, unless you got lucky. So standard pictures might not even cut it for you at this point with that 100% bonus. To be fair, you can still use it for what little time is left in the game, just not to great use, which for a psychopath reward is a bit of a deal killer. Kinda has the same problem the meat cleaver does now that I think about it. There's also already two books that, when combined, give you a 50% boost to PP from a much earlier point in the game, so players who want to level up with pictures already have had a good way to do so, further limiting the use of this book. And if this run you're not seeing Kent's mission to the end, you're not using this book at all. Finally, and this holds true for all the PP books in the game, is that you really don't get any use for them once you reach level 50. If Boss Unlocks carried into New Game Plus, this might have actually gotten close to the top 10, because in theory, it is that good. But in practice, there's really nothing left to use it with. Leaves it really only better than the book that's meant for literal playtime. I'm convinced Weekly Photo Magazine has actually had its effects changed from an earlier version. The description makes it sound like it was originally required for photo opportunity markers to appear at all. This would actually line up with other skill books like cooking or skateboarding. This appears to have been made a default ability in the final build, and I have trouble imagining that Stippa wouldn't have found something by now related to this in the other builds he has. But hey, if my theory's actually correct and this was changed, then I think it was a change for the better for the sake of new players, but it really hurt the book in the long run. Its current perk of simply letting the player know what kind of photo a subject will count as is not actually all that helpful, since the kind of photo is often irrelevant. There's no achievements for certain types of photos, mixing and matching different emotions doesn't net you more PP. Aside from giving Kent a photo of Jesse's boobs and thighs, there's no call for a certain kind of photo in the game. Well, speaking of Kent, that is at least one of its better uses. It gives you a good idea of what is and isn't erotic. But it also highlights one of the bigger problems with the book. It lights up something when it's visible to Frank, not when it's able to be registered by a picture. This will become a problem if you're trying to get a particular kind of shot with survivors, and you'll be confused as to why certain things are not getting marked despite it being highlighted by the book. Ironically, this book is not actually very helpful at getting you to take better pictures. This book's effect does actually make it a half-decent radar. The blue marker lets players know what zombies are actively looking for something to munch on, and the green markers let them know if they're holding something. A shopping cart, a propane tank, a queen. That last one is really useful in overtime mode, trust me. It's also what places it above the other two books, if I'm being honest. It's the only saving grace of it. Bicycle's a nifty little item that never truly returns in the later games, so having a book that increases its durability threefold while giving you extra tricks to perform sounds nice. And to be fair, it is nice. The problem is, there's only two bikes in the entire game, one in the entrance plaza, and another in Alfresca Plaza, and unlike the skateboard, the bike is a vehicle. Sure, it means it doesn't take up inventory, but it means you can't pick it up to begin with. It won't leave Alfresca Plaza, no matter how hard you try and the one in the entrance plaza can only go to Paradise Plaza and the movie theater. This does mean you can use it to just zerg rush your way through the raincoat cults when you want to face Sean, so that's cool. The one in Alfresca Plaza also makes getting the Gordon a bit easier if you plan to save him. However, that's more of a positive to the bike itself. 
The book's two main benefits are that it triples the durability and allows you to jump when using it. But aside from these two examples, the bike's too limited in where it can go. Not helped by the fact that for the one in the entrance plaza, it takes so long to get to, you can probably just walk to where you'd ride it to, so it's really only good for the raincoat cult in that case. Or, better yet, just go upstairs to the second floor in Paradise or Entrance and get a skateboard. While not as bad as the hobby book in this regard, the bike just doesn't benefit that greatly from the increased durability or the ability to jump like the skateboard does. The skateboard by default is just made of fiberglass, and the ability to jump over obstacles means you don't have to slow down. The bike already lasts for 100 hits, so it has the durability to do a few collisions here and there. And again, because of how limited it is where you can go, odds are you'll get where you need to go before it gives out. You can't cover enough distance to really justify needing that extra durability. If you could find the bike in a few more places in the mall, like Wonderland Plaza and Leisure Park, this book probably would have ranked at least a bit higher. However, honestly, regardless of that, it should have been merged with skateboarding. Hmm. Hmm. I feel like I'm about to upset some people with this one. This book is locked behind Defeating Cliff, and that's half the reason it ranks this low. Much like with Camera 2, you're just too limited in where you can use this book. You can't make use of it for the first few psychopaths in the game, severely limiting its use in a no-weapon challenge starting from level 1. The moments the players are forced to use their bare hands, like fighting the cultist, Kent's betrayal, or, you know, just fighting Brock, all these situations remove your inventory to begin with, so it doesn't help you there either. It's also not even that helpful for increasing your unarmed combat. Now sure, a level 50 Frank can now beat a zombie to death with his bare hands. And given how fast he punches, that's actually not that bad. But in terms of his skill moves, the karate chop and jump kick still can't one-shot most night zombies reliably, or even cultists outside of a lucky blow to the head. Execution moves, like the neck twist or disembowel, they already kill zombies by default. And the same is true for crowd clearers, like the giant swing, the hammer toss, or the double lariats. Finally, I can't even say that it helps you all that much against bosses. Frank already has a lot of moves like the somersault kick that can do a stupid amount of damage without the aid of this book. If this book had some strong secondary effect, like giving you permanent spitfire so long as you hold it, or doubling the prestige points from skill moves, well, probably would have gotten a lot higher. This book is literally useless after the single mission it's used in. The core defense against this, well, outright fact, is that you actually need the book to complete the mission. So, objectively, it's more useful than the five books on the list already, right? Well, I have a few less smartass reasons as to why this book is not the worst. Part of it is just that Tourist is not a very interesting mission without it. Take away the language barrier and some of the funny dialogue that Sinji and you, I think that's how you pronounce their names, say, and it's just another example of talk to the survivor till they come with you. A rather dull approach to side questing that the first Dead Rising, outside of a few creative examples, was rather guilty of. But more importantly, I think that this is a really good tutorial for books. There is a real chance that players have ignored bookstores up until this point, so having a mission and a book devoted to teaching that I think is very important. And, unlike most tutorials, it doesn't hamper new playthroughs. The book's right there where you need it, you can grab it before you talk to them, allowing you to actually skip dialogue and get the mission done faster. And since this mission is right next to Out of Control, you're gonna be here anyway. I'm not trying to convince you this book is any more than what it is, it literally is just a tutorial for a mechanic that players may not have used yet, but it's non-intrusive, it's very straightforward, and it makes a mission more interesting. Not enough to make it to C tier, but unlike a lot of the books in D tier, Japanese conversation does what it needs to do, and it doesn't need to do much. Hmm. Hmm. 
Sometimes Dead Rising gives two books with the same effect. This is actually a benefit to the player. There's more than one place to find that particular perk if the player's looking for it, and you can equip both books to double up or at least combine the effects since perks stack. And of all the books to have doubles, these two are the weakest. To explain this, I'm afraid we need to use math. This book would be at its most useful when going for zombie genocide or at a fairly low level. Not sure how often that happens, but I'll roll with it. Frank can receive 500 PP for every 50 zombies killed, and an extra 20,000 PP for every 1,000 zombies killed. Let's assume the player kills 60,000 zombies during their playthrough going for that achievement. That means there will be 1,200 small bonuses and 60 mega bonuses. That breaks down to a total of 1,800,000 PP with that number going up to 2,700,000 PP. An extra 900,000 PP isn't anything to be upset with, but this is an extraordinary situation, an achievement that takes a full playthrough to be done no matter when you do it. And you gotta do it no later than Frank's level being at 40. Wait any longer than that and the bonuses only get you to level 50 faster, not get you to level 50 when you otherwise wouldn't. That is something that, at best, a player is only gonna do once. I've never heard of anyone starting the game over from scratch intentionally just to get Zombie Genocider again, just to unlock the Mega Buster. But I mean, hey, if you're in that situation, no reason not to, I guess. But for people going through a more standard playthrough, keep in mind that you can get 2,856,000 PP from just saving all the survivors. And that's without any book effects. You also get an extra 505,000 PP from the Psychopaths, Every cultist gives you 500 PP, the special forces give you 5,000. So, there's faster ways to level up Frank beyond killing zombies. And if you need just a few more thousand PP for a level up and can't find any survivors, just throw a queen into a horde of zombies and photograph their heads exploding. Outside of newer players relying on zombie kills for level ups, these books are really outclassed by the other ways to earn PP, and the books that enhance said ways. If you're doing a level 1 run, you're either confident enough that you don't need to be at level 50, or you've optimized your roots enough to where you can reach level 50 without killing zombies in mass. But there is an appeal here, no matter how niche it is, and you don't have to get too far in the game to get both books. That's nice. Hey, you know what we haven't had in a while? A book you get by defeating a psychopath that's given too late in the game to live up to its true potential. Oh, my favorite! Yeah, brainwashing tips being this low is probably weird for some people. But to explain why, we need to carefully reread that description for this book. Survivors no longer fear death and readily charge into danger. This is not Dead Rising 2's leadership. In fact, it's quite the opposite. While leadership would only remove the physical downsides of survivors, and the player only had to deal with their personality quirks, brainwashing tips turns every survivor into Kendall, violent and loyal. What this means is that any survivors who are physically handicapped in some way are really no different besides not freezing up in fear, which is a mute point half the time since you still need to manually escort the injured anyway. This limitation, combined with how late you get it, is why it's so low. There are only 16 survivors left to be saved at this point, counting Sean's hostages. Gil and Susan need to be manually escorted, and Cheryl and Mindy can't be given weapons, so the extra aggression for them is of little use. On top of that, Tad and Simone are so close to the safe house that the book really doesn't matter and you don't even need to give them weapons. So you're really just making 10 of the final survivors easier to save. But hey, even at max level, it's common for people to try to save all the survivors anyway. So no reason not to use this book once you get it, especially if you have the inventory for it. This book could really use a better name, because I don't know a single person building a fence in their living room. Okay, real talk. This feels like it's meant to complement Lifestyle Magazine, another book in the game. But while that book works with the common items found inside buildings, this one only works with the furniture. And furniture, more often than not, does not fit in Frank's inventory. Meaning that you can't really take most of this anywhere, and you drop it if something so much as slaps you. 
However, there are two things that hold this book up as high as it is. Or at least, not as low as it is. The first is the Mannequin Torso, which can one-shot zombies reliably at level 1, and at level 50, even nighttime zombies often die to a single blow. And it lasts for 50 hits without a book. And since every piece of the mannequin is affected by this book, and since two mannequins spawn right outside the safe house, this means that every run can begin with weapons that last for 150 hits with this book alone. And second, while furniture is never exactly the long-term answer, it can be deadly with just a few attack upgrades, so it makes a good improvised weapon if you're good with the timing of heavy attacks. And on New Game Plus runs especially, the player can easily just jump into a store, pick up a chair, and make some space from the undead. And Dead Rising kind of encourages you to restart and carry your levels over if you're struggling. And I think it's safe to say that a player who is struggling is probably the player who's going to benefit the most from getting more out of the furniture. So hey, if you are that kind of struggling player who needs to constantly run into a store and get a weapon to defend themselves, this book might not be bad to have. Of course, just stocking up on mannequin torsos is probably better, and this isn't the only book that works with that item. Okay, this is a weird one. Instead of doubling the effect duration of mixed drinks, this allows you to create double lasting mixed drinks. Trust me, that wording makes all the difference. It means that the book does not affect any mixed drinks you've already made or looted off a hostile enemy in the infinite mode, making this book useless in said mode. But on the other hand, it means that the effect to the drink is permanently applied once it's created, making this the only book in the game, actually to my knowledge, in the franchise, where you can reap the benefits even after you drop it, so long as you made the drink while holding it. So, you can quickly run into Entrance Plaza, grab this book, go back to Paradise, make the drinks, and then drop the book. This is really helpful in overtime mode if you just want to make quick steps and get around real fast. In fact, it's better than the skateboard at that point. It does mean you have to beat Carlito a second time to use it, but this book is also the only way Energizer is ever worth using. So, while most players won't carry this book for their entire run, it can be quickly adapted into nearly any playstyle, provided you have a single inventory slot to use. And, of course, provided you use mixed drinks in the first place. Skateboarding is just cycling, but for an actually useful item. The skateboard itself is just inherently useful. They spawn indefinitely in Paradise Plaza and the Entrance Plaza, and they fit in your inventory to boot. So not only can you always have one, you can take it basically anywhere. The ability to perform tricks also helps avoid one of the biggest problems with the skateboard. Momentum. Since you normally have to move around obstacles in the mall, but you can't risk running into zombies, this normally means getting off your board and having to walk around or over something, then getting back on. The time spent stopping and starting really starts to add up, as does the time you save by just jumping over things in the first place. So the tricks are very useful. But the durability buff is what makes this book king of the C tiers, as well as forever locked out of B tier. While tripling the durability is nice and all, 3 times 3 is just 9, and 9 hits in Dead Rising isn't much. The skateboard is going to need at least a second book to have the durability necessary for those longer trips through the mall, especially places like North Plaza. Ignoring my dislike for the idea of a book only affecting one item in the first place, this leaves skateboarding in a very strange place. If you want to use a skateboard, this book is probably going in your inventory. But if you're using a skateboard, this book alone probably isn't going to cut it. And if you're not using a skateboard, this book is useless. I guess the old saying's true. The Jack of all trades is the master of none, but often more useful than the master of only one.
The main use of this book is actually pretty similar to skateboarding. Make use of shopping carts to get around the mall faster. They don't fit in your inventory, and they're a little more clunky to move around, and you don't get tricks with them. But the sheer durability this book gives them, a whopping 135, which is more than the skateboard when triple booked, and the fact that they're just so common, yeah. If you're a low-level player, this is probably a preferable way to get around. And on top of that, it still gets better as you get higher level. If for no other reason, then you can carry other things besides this in a shopping cart. Like the Perfume Prop, a decent little improvised weapon, at least when you get Frank to a high enough level. But wait! There's more! Hang on to your seat, baby! The Weapons Cart. This thing already lasts 300 hits, which is more than you'll ever realistically use it for, but it goes to a ridiculous 900 hits with this book. That is just the best kind of stupid, if you ask me. On the not-so-good kind of stupid, you can't really use this thing if you want to save survivors. Ignoring the real chance you might accidentally run them over and kill them with it, you gotta babysit survivors in this game, which actually means going too fast becomes a detriment. Skateboards fit in your inventory, and shopping carts are very replaceable. So unfortunately, the super durable weapons card is more of just a fun mess around thing than an actual strategy. Oh yeah, I almost forgot, this weapon works with the pickaxe. It's not a bad weapon either. Wartime Photography feels like the name of the book that Kent should have dropped, but that's not terribly important. What is important is that Camera 1 is available literally right away, like as soon as you get to Paradise Plaza properly, and with all the PP stickers in Paradise Plaza and the food court that you're about to enter, that 25% boost can make a big difference early game in terms of PP. It can also help with Kent's photo challenges, and you don't need to beat Kent in order to get it. And once Case 2-2 is active, Wartime Photography becomes available. That's a 50% boost to photos if you carry both, which means that photo opportunities now give you an extra 5,000 PP if you get a good shot. There's really not a whole lot to actually say about these two books. Do you like taking photos, or are you having trouble with Kent's mission? Pick these up. Entertainment works with both the small chainsaw and the skateboard. Combine both of those with criminal biology and skateboarding to completely trivialize the game. But if you're not interested in breaking the game in half, what else does it boost? Well, there are the TVs, which are decent improvised weapons, but are shockingly uncommon. There are the bowling balls, but they use the rock's unwieldy overhead smash. They're every bit as lethal as a rock, though, and they get the funniest range attack in the game. But who needs balls when you have guitars? These things are deadly, if not a bit awkward, last twice as long as the lead pipe, have some of the best heavy attacks in the game, and with this book, they can outlast most boss weapons, which is good, because they only spawn in Paradise Plaza. Doing this whole tier list made me realize Dead Rising 1 doesn't spread its weapons out as well as its sequels did, and that plays a major role in what one of the best books in the game is. Seriously, why are there no acoustic guitars in the Wild West-themed food court? So instead of the usual gameplay montage I've been doing thus far, I'm just gonna let the math speak for itself on this one. I'm also going to assume that the benefit of getting six extra levels from a book is self-explanatory. And instead, I want to give some basic facts that influenced its placement on the list. Survivors are the most constant and consistent sources of prestige points. Survivors also give the highest overall PP values of any one activity making this the single most profitable PP booster in the game, despite this being the only one without duplicates. This book also just benefits from how popular a level 1 save all survivors run is. On the downside, once you've saved every survivor, this book is useless as it does not affect hostile enemy defeats, mutinies, or even requests. This makes it the only prestige point booster that is completely useless in overtime mode. And like the other PP boosters, it's of no use once you reach level 50. Believe it or not, given my personal playstyle, World News is my favorite book in the game, but favoritism is not enough to make it to A tier. 
as this book is just too limited to put it any higher than where it is. The baseball bat is the real reason this book is so high. It is one of the best weapons in the game, reliably kills zombies during the day, knocks zombies away that you don't kill so you can jump kick them or outright avoid them after the fact, and it's a pretty common weapon. One spawns right outside the safe house, there's three sports stores in different areas of the mall making it easy to find, you can get some in the park if you really need to, and they appear in trash cans from time to time. Not sure why, but I'm not complaining. How about the soccer ball? You can find three of them on the rooftops, and they can serve as a recyclable queen of sorts. A way to thin out the horde, and you can even reuse it if you manage to find where it flies off to. And if you just want to kill zombies a bit longer before having to restock, some of the lesser used but still strong weapons in the game like the dumbbell, barbell, and pickaxe are also boosted by this. Or you could just combine this with the entertainment magazine for bowling balls of steel. Of all the books to make it to the top five, I doubt anyone expected this one. Myself included. The first draft of this script had me making this joke to introduce the top ten, actually. So what did this book do to get this high? Well, in short, nothing special. It just works well with a lot of weapons. 22 to be exact. That's more than any other book in the game, and it's not even close. One of those weapons is the badass mannequin torso that I've already talked about with interior design, so I won't stand for that one any longer. So instead, here's just a quick rundown of some of the highlights from this catalog. Every chair and stool, which are fairly common heavy weapons that can be used in a desperate situation. The hedge trimmers. While I find triple booking these to be more of a meme strat, having at least one last three times as long means that you're basically untouchable to the common zombie, day or night. The lawnmower goes... <laughs> The paint cans are just decent improvised weapons, and plywood is one of the most deadly heavy weapons in the game if you actually find some. But when it comes to the real winners here, that goes to the sickle, which is actually a scythe. But on top of it being able to be triple booked, it's one of the only decent prestige point earners, and it can absolutely wreck hordes of zombies even at a low level. One of the best weapons beyond the mannequin torso this book affects. Quick little aside, although it's not one of the more powerful weapons in the game, the stepladder is a good anti-psychopath weapon due to its extended range as a melee weapon. It's also affected by this book. But overall, while this may not be as fancy as making the small chainsaw last forever, or being able to do a Tony Hawk run of the game, if you're playing Dead Rising and you want to improvise a weapon, Lifestyle Magazine will probably affect it more often than not. It's just viable on a lot of loadouts. Simple as that. This one is simple. Every weapon this book affects is good. Some better than others, but all of them are good. Lead pipes and 2x4 are just reliable and easy to find weapons, all around North Plaza especially, but the warehouse spawns one as well. There's also the chainsaw, the small chainsaw, the excavator, the hedge trimmers, the sickle, but most importantly, the sledgehammer. All in all, its benefits are pretty straightforward. Really good weapons that are more common than many others, thanks in no small part to North Plaza. And since the second half of the game may as well take place in North Plaza almost exclusively, making most of the weapons there last three times as long is just common sense.
carry one of these for a 50% healing bonus, carry both for a 100% healing bonus. Simple as that. Never a bad time to have one or both. One thing to keep in mind is a visual quirk with Dead Rising's UI. Each block of health equals 1,000 points of health, but the block is only removed when you're missing all 1,000 points it represents. This means that when recovery values are increased by 50% and you start getting values of 500, it'll sometimes seem like a small snack heals you for two, but then the next only heals you for one. That's not a bug, that's just the exact healing values not being easy to read. Literally the only reason it's not in S tier is that, with there being two of them, some players might want to wait until they have more room to spare before grabbing one or both. The last two books that did make it to S tier do not have that issue. To the surprise of absolutely no one who's actually played the game, bladed weapons are absolutely overpowered in the first Dead Rising, and this book is mainly the reason why. Literally every area in the mall has a bladed weapon of some kind, between the knife-wielding zombies, trash cans that drop knives somewhat frequently, and most restaurants having cleavers that are functionally the same as the hunting knives. Just pick up a knife with this book, and you have 60 swipes. That's 30 to 60 zombie kills, depending on Frank's level and the time of day. There's also things like the katana that spawns in Paradise Plaza, which can one-shot regular zombies, as well as dealing decent damage against psychopaths, the chainsaws in the hardware stores that let you just mow through crowds, the hedge trimmers I brought up for easy horde defense, the entrance plaza having battle axes, and of course... Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Four of the five unique boss drops are bladed weapons. This book makes them go from 100 to 300 hits, which, when combined with everything else I just said here, basically means you will never run out of powerful weapons when you hold this book. This is the most useful durability book in the game, hands down. Okay, I've been harsh to the other books that you get from defeating psychopaths, but that's just because I think their effects are a bit too specialized for how difficult they can be to get. Once you beat Kent, there's nothing left to take pictures of, so a book about pictures isn't really useful. And once you defeat Cliff, not only is wrestling very underpowered as I brought up, but you also have access to the machete and there's already a book to make that last three times as long. It will almost always be a better option. So, what does survival do? Well, double healing. There is literally never a reason to not have that effect. But, okay, let me paint a better picture. You have just defeated Cliff, and you got the keys to the room that he hides the survivors and the books in. And you find survival. Here are the four possible outcomes. One, you didn't have either health book, and now you can double any healing item for just one inventory slot. Two, you had one of the health books, and now you can replace that with survival, doubling the practicality of that book. 3. You had both health books, but now you can replace them with a single book giving you the same effect, freeing up a single inventory slot. 4. You had one or both of the health books, and now you can add survival to it and become Goku. You eat everything in sight, and you basically can't die. Then there's the infinite mode, that mode where your health is constantly draining and you try to survive as long as possible. There's an achievement for lasting 7 days in there. At best, you're gonna be really cutting it close without this book. But more importantly, this book alone doubles your chances to do so, gives you much more legroom. You can get all three books if you want to just go total overkill, or potentially go for the world record 17 days. But in terms of 7 day survivor, and by extension 5 day survivor which gives you the actually good reward, you only need survival for it. So, between the fact that more healing is good in basically any build, the fact that you can magnify or outright replace the effects of two of the best books in the game single-handedly, and all but literally being required for the game's hardest achievement, well, if there's a better book in Dead Rising, I'm all ears.